Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to part two of the Decemberists' Revolt Against the Tsar. If you have not seen the first part, go check it out. I'll leave a thing in the top right here. It's a fantastic video from Epic History TV. It has drama, it has a bit of chaos, it has death in it, and of course it has lots and lots of conspiring. And yeah. <laughs> That's where we're off today. It is currently December 14th, 1825, and Nicholas, who is not supposed to be the Tsar, but rather his brother Constantine, who has fled, basically, to Poland and is like, mm -mm, I'm not going anywhere near St. Petersburg, has decided to do an oath to him so that all the troops would have to sign, or sorry, would have to swear a loyalty oath, and for that point, the coup plotters know that it would be over. So they have to decide and launch their coup early and let's see what happens. If you've not already, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. It all helps the channel. If you'd like what you see here and you're like, hmm, I have a really super obscure video that I want to react to, go check out the Patreon. I just did my first series on it. Uh, I just finished part one on Genghis Khan by Extra History. So if you have anything, literally any suggestions, go to the Patreon, become a member there and let me know what you would like me to react to. Let's get into it. December 1825. The unexpected death of Emperor Alexander has thrown Russia into confusion. Mm -hmm. The line of succession had been secretly changed from his brother Constantine to a younger brother, Nicholas. As he struggles to assert his claim to the throne, a secret society of army officers prepares to make its move. This guy's face still Most makes me laugh. are veterans of the wars against Napoleon. Now they want a political revolution in Russia, an end to autocratic government and the abolition of serfdom. The fate of their revolution will be decided in a single day of chaos and violence on the streets of St. Petersburg. They will be known by the month of their uprising. Yes. The Decemberists. What a great title, eh? This video is sponsored by My Heritage, the world's leading service. Eight go, go find out who you are. 1825, St. Petersburg. The Decemberists Northern Society has its headquarters at the offices of the Russian American Company where one of its key members, Rilev, is a major shareholder. Hmm. Decemberist leaders... I've never heard of this company. The Russian-American company? It's sort of like the Hudson's Bay Company? But between Russia and America? Okay, ...have been anyways. working feverishly day and night to put everything in place for a coup. Rilev is the chief organizer, despite being unwell. Before dawn, they learn that the new emperor has ordered all troops and officials in the capital to swear an oath of loyalty to him that morning. They must act immediately. Once the mm -hmm. troops swear the oath, it will be too late. Most Decemberists are officers in the lifeguards regiments, stationed in St. Petersburg. They plan to tell their men that Nicholas, known and disliked by the troops, is usurping the throne from his brother Constantine, to whom the soldiers swore an oath of loyalty just 17 days ago. Yep. There is no plan to involve the Russian. And that was, as we learned in part one, super rushed, not very well coordinated, but imagine trying to communicate over an empire this large in, in, in 1825. Yeah. Some people in their revolt. These young aristocrats fear that this would only lead to the bloody chaos of the French Revolution. Mm-hmm. Rightly so. Instead, they will rely on their social connections and the unquestioning trust of the men under their command. They will then use these troops to seize control of the capital, the emperor, and the government. They will form three groups. The first will be led by Captain Alexander Yakubovich, a distinguished veteran of the Caucasus War with a reputation for courage. His men will seize the Winter Palace and secure Emperor Nicholas and his family. Mm. Some Decemberists want to keep the Emperor prisoner, 
but Rileyev secretly entrusts his assassination to 28-year-old Pyotr Kachowski, an officer recently retired due to ill health. As a cadet officer in the lifeguards Jaeger regiment, Kachowski had been demoted for rudeness, debt and laziness. See, and this, is, and this is the interesting thing that always happens with coups, right? So the coup that I'm probably the most familiar with is, is Operation Valkyrie. It took place in July of 1944 against Adolf Hitler. And what was interesting about that specific coup is that although there were lots of really grand ideas of what to do and here's how we can overthrow the government and we need to make sure the Fuhrer is dead, etc., etc., um, is that none of them ever truly fully agreed on what to do. Right? There were some that wanted to make peace with the Allies and then keep fighting against Russia. There were some that just wanted to not really capitulate, but end the war overall. And there was arguments and there was really groups within the group itself against, um, you know, against the overall idea of what to do. And it seems like this always happens where here you have one group that wants to put the emperor in prison. You have the other one that wants them shot. So him shot, sorry. And so you can imagine that if one of these two options happen here, right, one side is not going to be happy at all. So then they might even turn into another faction. This leads into a power vacuum. There's all this chaos going on. And yeah, it, it seems to be a running theme. And I'm sure that the more that we read about other coups, um, the more that we learn about other coups together, it's probably going to be some similar themes. No, without friends or money, but dedicated to the cause of liberty, and imagines himself a slayer of tyrants. A second detachment will be commanded by 32-year-old Colonel Alexander Bulatov, a hero of the Napoleonic Wars and Relief's childhood friend. He's recruited just a few days before the revolt, as the Decembrists seek to involve more senior officers. Hmm. His unit will seize the Peter and Paul fortress, which contains the city's arsenal and dominates the city centre. Looks so cool. I want to go Colonel these days. Prince Sergei Trubetskoy has been appointed dictator or leader of the coup. He is another officer of proven courage from a distinguished family. He will command the main force, expected to number nearly 10,000 men, which will assemble in Senate Square. Drubitskoy will then enter the Russian Senate and demand that it issues the Decembrists' manifesto to the Russian people. Hmm. The document announces the establishment of a new provisional government until elections can be held. The freedom of the press and of worship, equality before the law, the introduction of jury trials, and the abolition of serfdom and military settlements. Okay. Two well-known hey, and respected politicians. Here. Nikolai Morvinov and Mikhail Speransky would lead the new government to provide continuity and reassurance. If I'm to be emperor for only one hour, I'll show myself of being worthy of some. Fascinating. The Decembrists, drawing on their military experience, have come up with a realistic plan to seize control of the Russian capital. But almost immediately, the conspiracy begins to unravel. It's like 24. On a bitterly cold morning, Kachowski and Yakubovich come to Rileyev's apartments, where the Decembrists have been meeting. Kachowski has lost his nerve and is no longer willing to kill the Emperor. At the last mm. minute, Yakubovich has also decided he cannot shed the blood of Russian soldiers and refuses to lead troops against the Winter Palace. Yep. Bulatov, who is supposed to lead his troops against the Peter and Paul fortress, does not even show up. See what I mean? Always disintegrates because you the get those... The are in a race against... You get those rival ideas and then... Also nerves too. I mean, <laughs> I can only imagine trying to overthrow a government and what nerves of steel you'd have to have for that one. I. There are several guards regiments in St. Petersburg. They must win over enough of them to secure the capital before the regime understands what's going on and moves against them. But they learn that the Senate and Priobrzezhensky lifeguards have already sworn the oath of loyalty to Nicholas. Mm. 
This painting was based on sketches made later by the Emperor himself. It shows the Priobrazhensky Lifeguards 1st Battalion arriving at the Winter Palace that morning. It's an act of loyalty for which Nicholas will always be grateful. Hmm. A battalion of the Moscow Lifeguards Regiment comes over to the Decembrists' cause. Thanks to the efforts of Captains Shepin Rostovsky, Mikhail Bestuzhev, and his okay. brother Alexander Bestuzhev. One to one so far. But the regime is moving much faster than expected. Officers loyal to Nicholas, now aware of the unfolding coup, arrange for the Ismailovsky, Semyonovsky, and Pavlovsky lifeguards regiments, and the lifeguards horse regiment, to swear the oath to Nicholas. It's over. Okay. 700 men of the Moscow Lifeguards Regiment leave their barracks and march through the icy streets to oh, Senate no. Square. Oh, do they know that the other regiments have already taken the oath, though? Okay, this is not going to be good, is it? Their rallying cry is for Constantine and Constitution. Oh, this is not going to go well. The men of the Moscow Lifeguards Regiment take position in Senate Square, near the famous bronze statue of Peter the Great. They are joined by several Decembrist leaders, including Rilev and Kachovsky. Captain Alexander Bestuzhev ostentatiously sharpens his sabre on the base of the statue. Officers and men look resplendent in full dress uniform. But Trubitskoy, the leader of the coup, who is to present the Decembrist Manifesto to the Senate, is nowhere to be seen. Nice. And the members of the Senate have already gone home. The left <laughs> leaves to find him. Oh no. Okay. Crowds of spectators begin to gather around Senate Square. The general mood is one of support for the Decembrists. This watercolour was painted by Karl Ivanovich Kolman, an eyewitness, and is considered one of the most realistic depictions of the day. Yeah. Around noon, Count Mikhail Miloradovich, Governor General of St. Petersburg and a famous war hero, arrives in the square. He rides straight up to the Moscow Lifeguards Regiment and asks, Who among you was with me at Kulm, Lutzen and Bautzen? Recalling the great battles against Napoleon. Mm. He tells the men they have been lied to, that Constantine has renounced the throne, and they must swear the oath to Nicholas. Uh, In Trubitskoy's absence, Lieutenant Prince yeah. Eugen Abelensky becomes de facto leader of the Decembrists in Senate Square. He tells Miloradovich to leave, but the general ignores him. Abelensky tries to prick the general's horse with a bayonet to drive him away, but accidentally stabs the general. <laughs> Then Piotr nice. Kachowski steps forward and shoots Miloradovich at point-blank range. The general, mortally wow. wounded, is carried away by his horse. The light Just point-blank, cold-blooded murder to man. Okay. Lifeguards Grenadier Regiment and sailors of the guard declare for the Decembrists. They join the Moscow lifeguards in Senate Square. The Decembrists are gathering a powerful, disciplined force of 3,000 troops in the heart of the Russian capital. But Trubitskoy has still not appeared, and there is little leadership. They stand and wait in the freezing cold, oh. while the Emperor begins to mobilize his own forces. Unbeknownst to the men in Senate Square, He's betrayed Prince them, Sergei he? Trubitskoy had given up all hope of success early that morning, as soon as he heard that the Senate had sworn its oath to Nicholas. Possibly suffering some form of breakdown, he wanders around the city, at one point passing by Senate Square itself. His brilliant military record makes such behaviour difficult to understand. Hmm. A Decembrist later recalled, his absence had a decisive influence upon us and the soldiers too. For with few epaulets and no military titles, no one dared take command. Rilev, meanwhile, exhausted. Interesting, and so you gotta wonder too, right? Like, what if 
he had have actually shown up, right? So you have all the other regiments that have already sworn allegiance to Nicholas. So I would imagine that just in a purely numbers game, mm, right? It, how much blood would have been spilled? How much blood is going to be spilled? I don't know. We haven't finished here. But yeah, just so interesting that just those tiny little things in history that if they just had been slightly different, right? How, what would have been the overall outcome and how much would it have changed? That's just always so, so interesting. Maybe one of you guys, if you, if you have a link to another video or maybe have your own explanation, I'd be curious to hear it. Let me know. Busted and sick, spends the day in a futile search for Trubitskoy before he is forced to retire to bed. At 12? The crowd is now several thousand strong and their loyalties clearly lie with the Decembrists. Some policemen and patrols are even attacked by civilians. When Emperor Nicholas arrives, he and his entourage are pelted with sticks and stones. Wow. Okay. But guards units loyal to the government are arriving at Senate Square in force. Oh, they're going to be take circle. up positions surrounding the rebels. Soon they outnumber the Decembrists three to one, though not all are willing to fire on their comrades. In fact, Isaac's bridge is deliberately obstructed by troops of the Finnish lifeguards regiment, whose sympathies lie with the Decembrists. Mm. Others, such as General Orlov, are outraged by the Decembrists' actions. He orders his guards' cavalry to charge the rebels. His men are pelted with stones and timber thrown by the crowd, and the rebels stand firm. Some shots are fired, a few men are hit, and the cavalry withdraw. Several cavalry charges are made that afternoon, with no decisive outcome, and just a handful of casualties. Can you imagine the scene here, just how chaotic it must have been, and... Wow, wow. Still, no Decembrist officer takes charge of the situation. There seems to be no plan at all. Right. It is minus 10 Celsius, and their men have been standing motionless for hours. The commander of the Lifeguards Grenadier Regiment, Colonel Nikolai Stürler, arrives to order his men back to barracks. Kachowski shoots him, inflicting another fatal wound. The Metropolitan Bishops of St. Petersburg and Kiev approach the... Tr Wait, so he shot two people at this point? ...troops and tell them it is their Christian duty to swear the oath to Nicholas. Okay. But they are mocked and chased away. Really? The Emperor is huh. deeply alarmed by the situation in Senate Square, though many comment on his calm demeanour. He later confides to his younger brother, the most amazing thing about this story is that you and I were not shot. Hmm, fair enough. The short winter day is ending. Nicholas fears that if the standoff continues into the night, the crowds will turn hostile. He now has 32 guns of the guards' artillery at his disposal. Oh, no. He sends General Sukozanet to tell the rebels to lay down their arms, or they will be fired upon. It's a bad choice of emissary. Yep. So Kozanet is despised by the troops. They tell him to get lost. As dusk falls, the guns are wheeled forward. The first volley is blank rounds. The next is fired over the heads of the rebel troops, but hits several people in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <coughs> sorry. Oh my god, that's 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 kind of funny. I'm sorry. Ah, oh, I, I I think I just made my camera. <laughs> so they're trying <laughs> They're trying to warn the people in the center. Oh, sorry. They're trying to warn the people in the center. <laughs> to leave and so they fire blanks all right makes sense and then they shoot cannonballs over their heads and then just take out innocent civilians oh that's not oh that's awful because people's lives died but i mean come on that's kind of that's kind of sickly funny oh my god let's keep going the troops stand firm 
<laughs> the next volley of grape shot is fired directly into their pack's ranks. Scores go down. Ugh. Now I feel bad for laughing, but I mean, come on. Under this murderous fire, the troops break ranks and head out onto the frozen Neva River. No. Mikhail Bestuzhev oh, no. tries to organize them for an attack on the Peter and Paul fortress, little more than a thousand meters away across the ice. But as they form up, they come under more artillery oh, fire. Oh no, oh no. Cannonballs smash the ice. Many drown. The rest escape as best they can. After a standoff lasting several hours, the military revolt has been ruthlessly crushed by Russia's new emperor. The official wow. death toll is just 80. Eyewitnesses claim it is much higher. Of course. The Decemberist leaders, who all survived the bloodshed in Senate Square, are rounded up and arrested that night and the following day. The Decemberist uprising in St. Petersburg is over. The revolt in the... And it just came down to leadership. It really just came down to leadership. So you gotta wonder what would have happened if, right? Ugh. Shame, because it seems like the, the objectives really, really are what would you say? I don't want to just say good, but you know, just and, and forward thinking and progressive and wanting the best for the Russian people. But so it is. South has yet to begin. Oh yeah, right, good point. I totally forgot about that. Thirteenth December, eighteen twenty five. Tolchin, Ukraine. The day before the St. Petersburg revolt, yeah. Pavel Pestel, leading figure of the Southern Society, is denounced by one of his officers and arrested. Mm. The Southern Society's plans for an uprising are thrown into chaos. Sergei Muravyov Apostol takes over as leader. He receives news of the disastrous uprising in St. Petersburg, but decides to go ahead with the planned rising in the south. On the 29th of December, he is arrested himself, but quickly freed by fellow officers. The next day, he leads two companies of the 29th Chernigov Regiment into Vasilkov, where they seize money, weapons, ammunition and supplies. Three more companies, more than 400 men, join the rebels. The next morning, a revolutionary manifesto, written by Muravyov Apostol and Lieutenant Mikhail Bestuzhev Ryumin, is read out to the troops. In the question and answer form of a religious catechism, hmm. the document calls for an uprising to end autocracy, serfdom and conscription. Conscription question, as well, interesting. What does our holy law order the Russian people and army to do? Answer, to repent of our lengthy servitude and stand against tyranny and wickedness, vowing that in heaven and on earth there shall be only one emperor, Jesus Christ. By the 1st of January, Muravyov Apostol leads a force of 17 officers and 1,100 men. He attempts to march on Zhitomir to link up with units of the 8th Infantry Division whose officers are sympathetic to the Decemberist cause. But his route is blocked by government forces. Then, on hmm. the 3rd of January, at Ustimovka, his force is intercepted by troops under General Geismar. Are they going to open fire the on the comrades? Apostol hopes the opposing troops will join him. Yeah. Instead, they open fire with grape shot. Then the Hussars Sad. charge. A few men are killed, but most quickly surrender. 895 men and six officers are taken prisoner, including Muravyev Apostol, who is badly wounded. His brother, Ippolit, and another Decemberist officer, Anastasi Kuzmin, take their own lives to avoid capture. 
the Decembrist uprising in the south is over. Crushed in just five days. Wow. What now? What now? I would imagine that things don't get better, rather worse. In St. Petersburg, the Decembrist leaders are interrogated by Emperor Nicholas in person, before in they are person. sent to the Peter and Paul fortress. Wow. The Emperor gives instructions on how each prisoner is to be treated, whether they are to be kept in shackles and treated severely or more gently. He despises them all. Trubitskoy he describes as a repellent example of an ungrateful scoundrel. Nicholas sets up a commission to investigate the plot and its origins. 579 suspects are arrested and subjected to repeated interrogations, long periods of solitary confinement, hunger and cold, or feigned sympathy. Many confess freely, revealing details of secret societies and names of co-conspirators. A no. few resist defiantly. Colonel Bulatov, who was to have led the attack on the Peter and Paul fortress, is so racked by guilt that he kills himself in his cell. There are no trials as such. Five months later, the commission returns its verdicts to the Emperor. 290 are acquitted, 289 are guilty, with 121 judged to be the greatest offenders. A supreme criminal court is formed to carry out sentencing, according to 11 categories of guilt. Devised by Mikhail Speransky, the man the Decembrists had hoped would lead their new government. Wait, what? The Wait, so he wasn't indicted in any sort of way? Wasn't he, sorry, unless I missed something, but wasn't he also conspiring with them? Or had they just hoped that he would join their side? Sorry if I missed something there, but if he was conspiring with them as well, <laughs> like, you get away scot-free and then you get to dish out the punishments at everyone else, that's extra brutal, no? Okay, I, I, I have a feeling, though, that they just wanted him to join their side, but we'll see. Those found guilty of minor crimes are demoted and sent to fight in Russia's long-running war in the Caucasus, mm. along with the regiments that joined the Decembrists. 31 of the Decembrists found guilty of the most serious crimes, conspiracy, rebellion, desiring the Emperor's death, are to be executed by beheading. But Nicholas shows mercy and commutes their sentence to hard labor for life in Siberia. This would be a running theme in Russian history. Before they depart, officers are stripped of their rank and noble privileges and ceremonially disgraced their greatcoats are burned, their swords snapped in half. This is the punishment handed out to Nikita Muravyov, who drafted the Northern Society's constitution for a new liberal Russia. And to Prince Sergei Trubetskoy, the Decembrists' vanishing leader, whose life is only spared because of his family name. Yeah, so I'm wondering too, what was he doing in between this time? They said he was wandering the streets and everything like this, but I mean, what was that moment that he, did he ever have that moment where he realized that if he had have taken charge and been a leader, then he could have possibly successfully led this rebellion. It looks like the odds weren't in his favor, they were outnumbered, but who knows, maybe with the civilian populace. <sighs> yeah, only history can tell, I suppose. Five Decembrists will not be spared. Pyotr Kachowski, Sergei I mean, Muravyov Apost. I mean, the first one he did kind of murder two men in cold Stop. blood, but. Mikhail Bestuzhev Ryumin, mm. Pavel Pestel, and Kondraty Relief. A public death for the chief instigators and conspirators will be their lawful revenge for disturbing the public peace, Shame. Nicholas writes to members of the commission. All five are sentenced to death by quartering, a brutal punishment oh, involving no. public dismemberment. Oh, God. 
God and the Sovereign have decided my fate. I must die, and die a shameful death, oh. Rilev writes in a final letter to his wife. Pray to God for my soul. For those who don't know what quartering is, and I, I know someone read a comment, sorry, sorry, someone wrote a comment on it. I believe it's when you get like each of your limbs tied to a horse and then they get set off in different directions. I, yeah. Horrible, horrible way to die. Thirteenth July, eighteen twenty six. Nicholas commutes the sentence to hanging, but the execution of the five Decemberists by the ramparts of the Peter and Paul fortress is badly botched. Of course. As the men are hanged, ropes break, and three men fall to the ground. What a miserable country. They can't even hang us properly, remarks one survivor. Spect yeah, just let that sink in for a moment. That's sickly funny. That is definitely some dark humor. Tater's appeal for mercy. According to tradition, a man who survives a hanging should be spared. Instead, more rope is found. And the second time, there is no mistake. The same thing happened during the Nuremberg trials too. The, uh, the execution was done by a very yeah, very, very strange man. I don't remember his name at the, off the top of my head, but he was an alleged hangman that had absolutely no experience in being a hangman. And he botched, I think, almost every single execution of the Nuremberg, um, of, of the men who were, who were on trial at Nuremberg. And all of them, yeah, died a slow, painful death. More than 80 Decemberists were eventually sent to Siberia. A few were accompanied by their wives, who voluntarily renounced their own noble privileges to be with their husbands. Wow, amazing, amazing women there. Conditions in Siberia were not as extreme as might be imagined. Their hard labor was mostly farm work. Wealthy prisoners were sent money from home, which they used to buy supplies. For active young men, boredom was the greatest enemy. Hmm. They took up hobbies, played chess, painted. These watercolors were painted by Nikolai Bestuzhev, who on the 14th had led the Imperial Guard sailors to Senate Square. Some formed their own academy, sharing their knowledge and going on to teach local children That's and amazing. set up schools. What? That's amazing. They wow. remained hopeful of a pardon, but it proved a 30-year wait. Mm. Only in 1856, after the death of Emperor Nicholas, was an amnesty announced for surviving Decemberists. Among them, Prince Sergei Trubetskoy, who returned to Russia and is seen wow. here, photographed in 1857. Crazy. The Decemberist uprising. I mean, fascinating. So I, I guess then in some sort of strange way that assuming that, well, these men did also seem to be in power in that region, that was arguably the most liberal, small L, liberal, whatever, uh, place in Russia. Fascinating to think about what might have been had they been able to exert more influence or maybe, you know, not try and overthrow the government violently, but uh, I don't know, just, yeah. Fascinating to think about what would have happened. Maybe Siberia was the place to be during this time. Probably not, but Still, it would be, probably be better than living under the authoritarianism of the Tsar. ...seemed to have been a total failure. A wildly optimistic operation, poorly planned, chaotically executed, doomed from the beginning. But with good The intentions. loss of life, thoughtless and unnecessary. But the Decemberists had mounted the first organized political revolt in Russian history. As such, their impact would prove far-reaching. We'll get into that. That's the, the next conspiracy, video. wrote the British resident minister in St. Petersburg, 
failed from want of management and want of a head to direct it, and was too premature to answer any good purpose. But I think the seeds are sown, which one day must produce important consequences. Just have to Emperor wait till 1917. Nicholas was never interested in reform. The issues of serfdom and a constitution would be around for decades to come. For those who took up the cause of reform, including Russia's liberal intelligentsia and future revolutionaries, the Decembrists were an inspiring example of action in the face of tyranny. The father of Russian socialism, Alexander Gertsen, was yes. their great champion. He named his political journal Polar Star, after Rilev's own. On the cover of its first edition, the five Decembrist martyrs. Cool. In time, the Decembrists' aims, the abolition of serfdom, a constitution, even the overthrow of the Tsar, were achieved. But their brand of 19th century liberalism was yeah. soon overtaken by events in Russia. So not only that their 19th brand, sorry, their 19th century brand of liberalism was overtaken, but was rather crushed and demolished by the coming by the Bolshevik Revolution and and uh, the, the the socialism that took place then in Russia. Um, I won't say too much on that topic because that is the that is the next video we'll be covering, which is oversimplified's Russian Revolution. But yes, the liberal ideas. Uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, equal before the law, right? These, none of these would really, uh, not even really, none of these would be able to take place under the Bolshevik Revolution, the upcoming civil war, and uh, the eventual, yeah, establishment of the Soviet Union. The communists never completely approved of the aristocratic Decembrists, though in 1925, they did allow Senate Square to be renamed Decembrist Square to mark the 100th anniversary of the Rising. But the Decembrists' place in Russian history remains highly contested to this day. A 2019 Russian blockbuster film was hmm. accused of trivializing the Decembrists and their aims. Others called for the film to be shown Why? in schools. While in 2008, the St. Petersburg Square, where the Decembrists made their famous stand, was renamed again, back to Senate Square. The Decembrists yeah. continue to serve as a warning to some, an inspiration to others. All that is certain is the Decembrists have not been consigned to history just yet. Thank you. Amazing video, absolutely incredible video. How do you see the Decembrists? Do you see them as, what would you say, misguided? Or do you see them also as an inspiration? Personally, from after watching this video, I see them as an inspiration. They were had really progressive ideas. They were the foundations of liberalism, which is a cause that I, you know, personally subscribe to. And yeah, although it was disorganized, it was messy, and it definitely could have been executed better, I think the intent was in the right place. And it's fascinating to think of, I think I've said this like six times, but like <laughs> if um, if the Decembrists had have succeeded, what could have happened? Could we have seen a more liberal Russia? Could we have seen them move more towards Europe? Or would we have sa still had the same violent events that eventually overtook Russia during the 20th century? Thank you all very much for joining me. If you've made it this far in the video, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And next, we will be looking at arguably one of Russia's most violent periods, the Russian Revolution by Oversimplified. So stay tuned for that one. It'll be out in a few days. Um, yeah, got nothing else to say. Thanks again, and I will see you guys in the next video. Take care.